In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we come to that great symbol of religious authority, the Ten Commandments. And a couple of weeks ago uh, I spoke a little bit about how the rules that God gives to the children of Israel become a sort of a testing to see how well they're doing. And that in Jesus, he moves it on to another way of doing things. And I want to revisit that process with the Ten Commandments today. So first of all, let's just think ex about the Ten Commandments themselves. Um, they occur twice, once here in Exodus, and another one in Deuteronomy chapter five. And the thing that you need to know about both of those, uh, those occurrences is that they don't sit well in the text. Uh, what I mean is, if you take the reading we had today and you remove it from chapter 20 and then you read straight through without it there, it makes much more sense. And so what that tells us is that this, this section that we call the Ten Commandments, or Ten Words is in Hebrew, has somehow been plonked into the narrative um, because it's so important. It clearly existed separately from the story about Moses going up and down Mount Sinai multiple times. And the writer who was compiling the book or, or whatever he was doing, we don't really know, decided that this was a good place to put it because the Ten Commandments effectively sum up all the things that God said to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai. And it's the Ten Commandments that have become sort of totemic in the modern world. In the old world, in the ancient world, I said two weeks ago that the big totem was actually the Sabbath. Um, but for us, it's the Ten Commandments. You get it in churches plastered on the walls. You get it in Hollywood. I mean, you know, Cecil B. DeMille, the great film that he made, was called The Ten Commandments. And little did he know that the way in which he presented that as God blasting out bolts of fire to, to carve those Ten Commandments into the two tablets of stone while Charlton Heston hid around the rock and looked the other way. Actually, he wasn't far off from how the ancients imagined it had happened. Um, if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 4, you get a description of, of, of this, the, the dark and stormy cloud. And, and, and it's a very important chapter because it makes the very clear that, you know, you didn't see God there. You didn't see any forms, you didn't see any likeness, any images. And so, so yeah, there's no place for idolatry. But what it did say was that you saw the words of God. And in Jewish tradition, they, they, they tried to unpick that and said, well, you know, how can you see words? And so they imagined that these words appeared like tongues of fire. Uh, and, and they celebrate this at Pentecost. And, 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 and there, all of a sudden, you get the images that we have in Acts of the Apostles with the tongues of fire over the apostles' heads. So when Cecil B. DeMille had bolts of fire blasting into the mountainside, he was sort of maybe, I don't know, consciously or unconsciously, picking up on this Jewish idea that the ten words were ten bolts of fire. And, and actually, they still have that resonance, that power today. What we need to think about, though, is the fact that laws change. Biblical laws change. I, I mentioned this in passing uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and, um, and I, I need to say a little bit more about that now. So if you read on from the Ten Commandments in chapter 20 of Exodus, you come a few verses later to a little-known law called the Law of Multiple Altars. Uh, and it, it runs something like this. Wherever you go, you must make a, uh, your altar must be of unhewn stones. Uh, and wherever you go, you can make an altar and there I will appear to you. That's the gist of it. Now in itself, that makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, but when you cycle forward to Deuteronomy chapter 12, you have what's called the Law of the Single Altar. Uh, and this has generally been dated not to Moses' time, but to several centuries later, to when Hezekiah, king of Judah in the end of the 8th century, introduced the law of the single altar in Jerusalem, saying effectively, you can't sacrifice anywhere but in Jerusalem. Prior to that, they'd sacrificed all over the place, like the patriarchs did. And so there you have a clear example of legal development. When Jesus came along, it really put the cat among the pigeons because he changed our relationship with law completely. And St Paul was wrestling with this 
in his entire life, but he expresses it very eloquently in our second reading today, when he was trying to, looking back over his past life, he said, I'm, I'm a really good Jew, I'm a, from the tribe of Benjamin, I'm a Pharisee, I'm so, ke I kept all the laws religiously, literally. And yet, it has nothing compared to knowing Jesus. And he's wrestling with this idea that all of that law keeping, all of that regulation and, and legalism that he had within his soul was simply not cutting the mustard. It wasn't making any difference to how he felt about being close with God. Martin Luther had a similar experience. He was a very good Catholic, keeping all the devotional things as a monk, um, and he realised it wasn't getting him anywhere. And that what there was something fundamentally different that needed to take place for him to feel saved. Jesus is the key to this. Because what Jesus does, he challenges the very basis of how people thought they could get close to God. And he does this by going to the temple. Now we've got to be careful here because Jesus is not challenging all Judaism. He's challenging those particular people who were in charge of the temple at that particular time and the corruption and so on that, that, was, that was rife within that system. And so what he was doing was saying, look, you know, all of this, it's just no good. And he told this parable of people who are tenants in a vineyard. And obviously, you know, the leaders are the tenants, the vineyard is Israel. We get that. What I think is really interesting is that in this parable, the tenants, they do the work. They actually tend the vine, produce the, the fruit, but the point is they won't hand it over to the owner. And this is what Jesus is saying the temple authorities have done. Yes, they're keeping all the rules and regulations, all the sacrifices and all that stuff, and the Pharisees are doing all their bit as, as lay people because they, you know, they weren't priests. Um, and, and they're all keeping all these, these ritual rules, and, and also some of them were keeping the moral rules as well, but what they weren't doing was giving proper worship to God. They were setting themselves up as, effectively, God. You know, keep all these rules in the temple, do as we tell you. Or, if you're a Pharisee, keep all these rules and do as we tell you. And you get it in churches today. You know, Keep all these religious rules and do as we tell you. And Jesus is trying to free us from that. He's trying to free us from being bound to rules which cannot save. Now, let's come back to the Ten, Ten Commandments, because most people think that, that there's good things in the Ten Commandments. And when Jesus quotes the Ten Commandments, it's interesting, he only quotes some of them. He only quotes the moral ones. Honour your father and mother. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. You know, those are things actually most decent people would think is a good thing to keep. But the religious ones, Sabbath, idol worship and so on, they're on a sort of a lower level. And, and at this point I can hear people saying, wow, you say that idolatry is a good thing? No, I'm not. But in Christian terms, we have moved on. We are now able to draw pictures of Jesus because Jesus was physical. And in Jesus, for the first time in human history, we see God made visible. Jesus himself said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. We see humanity transformed and we are able to depict that the important thing about this is, is it takes all the imagery that we see around us, and let's face it, there's an awful lot, adverts, newspapers, television, it's all image. And if it's just images of this world, it is, to a certain extent, all of it idolatrous. When you turn on your television, you are looking at an idol. When you're looking at me, I'm an idol, sorry. Not, not, not in that posh by sense. Um, and 
what we're trying to do in Christianity is present not humanity as it is, but humanity as it is transformed by Christ. And so when we see pictures in church or statues in church, we're not looking at the humanity of this world. We're trying to see what humanity becomes in Christ. And no amount of legalism is actually going to make that happen. What laws do is they stop us falling down. Yeah, when we're struggling, when we're feeling weak, laws prevent us from falling over. If you want to cross the road safely, use the Green Cross Code. Now, if you, if you may be of a certain age, you don't, you don't, never heard of the Green Cross Code, but there are rules about how you cross the road. And if you break those rules, you're likely to get run over. But actually, that doesn't transform your life. Transforming your life takes something far greater than a set of rules. So, going back to the Ten Commandments, yeah, they're great. They're a good peg upon which to, to hang our daily lives. Uh, and indeed, the, the reason why we think there are ten of them is because it's like a memory thing. You've got ten fingers, you can remember the Ten Commandments. Um, and, and, and it's a useful thing to do, to know the Ten Commandments and to keep them. But in themselves, they will not save you. Whereas knowing that you are loved by God and transformed by God, even though you can't keep all the rules, that will. So the good news of Christianity is that the laws are not there to stop us. They're merely a safety net. And what Jesus does, he shows us the real way. Now, he says to the, to the temple authorities, look, you know, this is the stumbling block that's mentioned uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Psalm 118. Um, this, 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 this fundamentally different way of thinking. And so, so what I would like to offer you today is this, this idea that we can be free to live as best we can, knowing that whoever we are, we have a God who really, really wants us to, to live well and be transformed. Um, the laws are there to help, but they are not an end in themselves. And so, as we think about the Jewish law and Christian law, let's also think about a world without law. A world in which people have so transformed their lives that laws are no longer required. Isn't that a wonderful idea? That we all trust each other so much and we all care for each other so much that we don't need regulation anymore. That's my image of heaven and I'd like you to share it too. Amen.